everyone. So I'm Andrea Cornwall, I'm the Head of School of Mobile Studies um, and I'd like to welcome you to the first in the Sussex Development Lecture Series for this term. So the Sussex Development Lectures are run collaboratively between the School of Mobile Studies, the Institute of Development Studies, the Centre for International Education and the Science Policy Research Unit. And this term, the theme is decolonising development. And some people might say, well, is development inherently colonial? How do you decolonise it? But actually it's quite an interesting thing to think about, about what forgotten histories, what kind of amnesias have been part of the development enterprise and a part of it in the present. And also the very question of whether or not it can be decolonised is a really interesting and important question to be asking now, as we have a wave of activity in universities around the world that are framing these questions. So I'm really, really delighted to welcome Gaminda Bambra. Gaminda is the first chair in post-colonial and decolonial studies, we think in the world possibly, certainly in the country. Um, we were delighted in the School of Global Studies to be able to create such a chair and for Gaminda to come and, and join us here. Um, and she'll be working with those of us in the university that have been thinking about some of these questions and leading us in thinking through some of these questions and the implications for all that we do, so not just the development, but for all of the things that we're teaching and learning here at Sussex and beyond. And if you haven't already registered, on the 11th of November, we're having a symposium on decolonising development, um, and that's going to be uh, held at the university, an all-day symposium, and you can find information about that um, on Eventbrite. Um, I'm going to open that up again for some more tickets. It's been very popular. Um, and we've got a series, I'll just quickly talk about the series this term. Here's a poster that you'll oops, be able to see out and about. Um, I'm talking on the 9th on decolonising gender and development. On the 23rd, we have Robert Nika van Niekerk uh, talking about decolonisation and transformation of higher education in South Africa, a case of Rhodes University. And on Thursday, the 7th of December, we have Olivia Ritazipwa from the University of Portsmouth talking on babies and bathwater, decolonising international development studies. And Olivia and I are organising the event on the 11th together. So anyway, welcome, um, and I look forward to a lively discussion. Very much look forward to Gaminda's talk, and over to you, Gaminda. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Can you all hear me at the back? Is that all right, the levels? Okay, excellent. I'm really, really pleased to be back at Sussex. I did my PhD here many, many years ago, and it's very nice to return, particularly to the Chair of Postcolonial and Decolonial Studies. A lot of the research that I've done over the past sort of decade or so has been about engaging with post-colonial and decolonial perspectives and bringing them into the social sciences and to think through how the social sciences might be rethought as a consequence of taking post-colonial and decolonial perspectives into account. So what I want to do in the talk today is really to talk through the idea of modernity, which I think is one of the central concepts that we have within the social sciences talk about the way in which it's standardly been presented in terms of the histories that are acknowledged to be part of the making of the modern world, and then think about what difference it would make if we were to take colonial history seriously in our understanding of modernity. So in part, the argument that I'm wishing to make to you here today is that the way in which, well, it's really to sort of think about how the histories that we acknowledge in the shaping of our concepts really matter. And it matters what we include and what we exclude. And so I'll talk through the issues in theoretical terms initially, and then hopefully have enough time left over to sort of try and work through what it is that I'm arguing for in terms of a practical example. So to start with modernity, I mean, modernity is one of the key concepts of the social sciences. It's perhaps the foundational concept, particularly of, of sociology, and this whole idea of how the modern world has come into being has been central for the shaping of disciplines and the relationships between disciplines. So in part, we might think about the ways in which modernity comes into being. And when I first started looking into this concept, one of the things that became very clear was that no matter how sociologists and social scientists may differ in their understanding of modernity, there were always two things that they all held in common. One was the idea that what modernity brought into being, or, or that it represented a temporal break, a break in time which separated out an agricultural pre-modern past from a modern industrial present. 
and that this temporal break was itself located spatially in terms of being located specifically in Europe or then sometimes also stretching across to North America and then from there modernity spread around the rest of the world. So despite all their other differences, these were the two issues that were absolutely central to our understanding of modernity. And when people were then fleshing out this sort of theoretical framework in terms of thinking, well, what are the histories that allow you to say that what modernity is constituted by is this temporal and spatial break, there would often be three key historical moments that were brought into the, the discussion. It would be the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, and both of these would be underpinned by a sense of the Cultural Revolution as embodied in the Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution that, that sort of went alongside it. Why the Renaissance was significant was in part because there was a sense that this was a period when Europeans discovered new texts, new knowledges. There was a sense that whereas in the past the ancients from classical Greece and Rome had been revered, that this was a moment when suddenly, in part because of these new texts that were coming into circulation, but more significantly because of, and I'll use the sort of wavy quote marks, the discovery of the Americas, there was a sense that people knew something that the ancients hadn't known previously. Similarly with the scientific revolution and the discoveries that were made in that context, there was again a sense that there was new knowledge in the world that hadn't existed previously, and that aspect of knowing something that people hadn't known before was central to the sense of being modern. The French Revolution was seen to establish the institutions of the modern nation state and associated concepts such as citizenship and sovereignty and, and so on, and a lot of our understandings of politics derives from work that was done in terms of understanding the revolution and the new state that came into being as a consequence. The Industrial Revolution was also deemed to be significant in large part because it established or it demarcated a capitalist industrial sphere from the agricultural sphere. And in many, in much social scientific work, it's this revolution that's often seen to be the main break that differentiates the traditional from the modern. Now, the way in which these events are presented within standard social science is always as if they emerged endogenously within Europe. So these are events that occurred in Europe, they occurred only as a consequence of the activities of Europeans, and only to do <clears throat> with stuff that was there already within Europe. Once these events had occurred, then they spread around to the rest of the world. So a lot of the standard narrative is about European origin and then diffusion. And my sense in relation to this was that this idea of both a temporal break and a spatial break was something that was very difficult to find within historical work more generally. So if you left the social scientific research to one side and then went and looked at the historical research that was being done in the humanities, then there was much more of a sense of, well, these, these sharp ruptures aren't really that of that much concern to historians. They're much more interested in continuities of thinking about how these things had their origins also in other locations and how these things interacted and uh, <coughs> worked in those senses. So I went back to look at these three events within the social sciences to look at, well, why is it that social scientists insist so much on the fact of these events being brought, at, brought into being through an endogenous European history when we could locate them within much wider histories. So in terms of the Renaissance, as I said, part of what demarcated it as special was this idea of these new texts. But the texts weren't new. They had been lost within Europe during the Middle Ages, but they had been circulating within the Islamic world during that period. And not just simply circulating within the Islamic world, but circulating and being worked upon and being developed and that knowledge comes back into Europe as a consequence of Islamic traders, merchants, scholars, and others who, who bring this research back into Europe. So there's a broader context to the Renaissance, which has it not be something that occurs endogenously to Europe, but it's also located within this broader cultural sphere. In terms of the French Revolution, and I'll go on to talk about this in more detail later, 
The French Revolution occurs at the same sort of time as the Haitian Revolution, and is, there's a strong relationship between Haiti and France, but that relationship is obscured in most presentations of thinking about the French Revolution. So if we think about the Declaration of Human Rights or the Rights of Man and Citizen that seemed to be one of the key documents that emerges out of the French Revolution, it wasn't in fact a solely French endeavour. The key clause within that declaration, the clause abolishing slavery, and I would suggest the most radical clause within that declaration, was actually inscribed into the declaration as a consequence of a delegation coming from Haiti to Paris and making the argument in the Constituent Assembly for the abolition of slavery. So one of the key texts of European civilization, if you want to put it in those terms, that is presented as the gift of France to the world. Indeed, it goes on to inform the UN Declaration of, of Human Rights that comes to be established in the 20th century, actually also has, as one of its co-constituents, a group of Haitian self-emancipated revolutionaries. And so in a sense, why have they not been part of our standard histories of thinking about human rights, and what would it mean to bring them back in? In terms of the Industrial Revolution, and this is my favourite, sort of, I've used this example many times, so really apologies to anybody who's heard it from me previously, but when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, we always talk about it in terms of something that emerges in Europe. If not Europe, then Western Europe, or then Britain. So it's the British Industrial Revolution, which then <coughs> develops in particular ways and spreads across the world. But if we try and locate the British Revolution in more specific terms, what is the British Revolution? What is it constituted by? Often the example that people give is cotton. The cotton mills of Manchester and Lancaster are seen as the heart of this revolution, which then goes global. But just think about that for a minute. The cotton mills of Manchester and Lancaster. Cotton isn't a plant that's native to England, let alone to Europe. It comes from India, as does the technology of how to dye and weave it. It's grown in the Caribbean and the southern states of the US by Africans who are taken there as part of the European trade in human beings. That raw material is brought back to England, where it's woven into cloth, and that cloth is then sold around the world, but often requiring the destruction of local cotton industries in other parts of the world, because this cloth is often inferior to that that's produced elsewhere. So the markets that are global and that we understand to be a consequence of free trade are not free because they've been opened up at the point of a gun to be able to sell this product. So the Industrial Revolution doesn't produce globalization. Globalization enables the Industrial Revolution. And that directionality is really important in our understanding of concepts that go on to be developed on the basis of those sorts of histories. And so these broader contexts are never part of the histories that we tell of what we present as the key events that bring the modern world into being. And we don't do that within our general understanding of the modern world or what comes to be known as modernity. And it's not been done in any of the variants of that, whether it's modernization theory or multiple modernity. So I want to talk to you just briefly about sort of modernization theory and multiple modernities, in part to point to the ways in which the concepts that we use rely on these parochial histories and what gets lost in the process of not taking the broader histories into account. So modernization theory emerges in the post-war period. It emerges in the context of the US sort of having won. You've got the Soviet Union there at the same time but the Soviet Union is seen to present a very different form of modernization to that that's expressed within the US. And what theorists associated with that school are keen to do is to make modernization theory the form of modernization that is taken up by people in other parts of the world. So at the time, in the immediate period after the Second World War, there was still the non-aligned movement, non-aligned countries, and there was a sort of, if you like, uh, a wish to try and persuade these countries not to follow the Soviet model, but to follow the, the US model instead. And so what modernization was presented as was this idea of change 
that was really based on an idea of linear change that's shifted from a traditional past to a modern future. And the sense was that as European influence and, and American influence spread around the world and interacted with these other traditional societies, that interaction would provoke a linear development which would allow them to become modern. You had people like Rostow and Lerner who talked about Western processes and modernization being used as the basis of a model of global applicability. So there was a basic sense that the whole world was going to become modern. It was just simply a, a, a question of when and how, and it would be better if they sort of went along the US version. And there was a sense also that even if becoming modern in the first instance was as a consequence of the peculiar circumstances of Europe, this was something that could then be, if you like, injected into other places, and they could be made modern in particular sorts of ways. Now, that was a dominant way of thinking about the modern and modernization in the sort of 50s and 60s, but it was contested very quickly. I mean, it was contested at the time as well, so modernization theory never had quite the hold over the social sciences as it's often assumed to have subsequently people like Henry Bernstein and others were key critics of modernization theory at the time that it was being articulated. But certainly by the late sort of 60s and 70s, it was being replaced by dependency theory, world systems theory, which contested the linearity of the earlier explanatory models and argued for more complex understandings of global economic systems. And so you had a period in the 60s and 70s where you have these different uh, competing explanatory models, but then you have a key event in the 90s, which was the fall of European communism, which suddenly sort of disrupted the way in which people thought about modernization. And for many commentators, I mean, you may remember Fukuyama writing The End of History, that this was, with the fall of European communism, this was the end of history. There was no longer a competition between the US and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had obviously failed, and the US example of how it was to be modern would be the dominant form that existed. But even with those commentators who were most committed to this understanding, there was still another question. That if the Soviet Union had failed and the US had won, why didn't the whole world look like the US? Why was it simply still a model, but not everywhere in existence? So this led then in the 90s to the development of the idea of multiple modernities. This was a way of trying to make sense of the fact that the Soviet Union had disappeared as an alternative, that everywhere would now be modern in the European US sense, but it also sought to make sense of the diversity that continued to exist within the world. Now this was a conceptual, or let me put it, the people who were sort of strongly associated with the development of multiple modernities were people like Schmuel Eisenstadt, who incidentally was also one of the key proponents of modernization theory in the 60s. And then in the 90s, he becomes one of the key theorists of multiple modernities. But also people like Wolfgang Schlupter, Johann Arneson, Peter Wagner. It was, it's a very strongly European-based uh, theoretical development. And in part, what they argue is that in making the shift from modernization theory to, to multiple modernities, there are two fallacies that need to be avoided. The first, and this is the problem, the first associated with modernization theory is that there's only one modernity. So within the earlier modernization theory, they believed that everybody would converge onto the same version of what it was to be modern. And they said, well, no, that was problematic. Everybody doesn't have to converge. Places can diverge. So they replaced convergence with divergence. The second fallacy they attribute to post-colonialism. And that's that looking from the west to the east is necessarily a form of Eurocentrism. So what they say is that because we're no longer arguing for all the other countries around the world to converge to being uh, to, to the Western European model, but rather we're allowing for divergence, but we also have to be clear that modernity did emerge in Europe initially, and that to look from the west to the east is not necessarily a form of Eurocentrism. How they manage to square the circle with this is to split modernity or to split the understanding of modernity into two. So they see modernity as constituted by the institutional realm, markets, states, bureaucracy, and the cultural realm, 
which is everything else. And what they argue is that European modernity is the unique conflation of the institutional and the cultural, where the cultural is part of the production of the institutional. But in the rest of the world, the institutional is what travels and it engages with different cultures in different places, such that those cultures inflect the institutional and you have multiple variations of modernity. So you can have an Islamic modernity, a Chinese modernity, a Turkish modernity, an Indian modernity. But what makes them all modernity is that there's a reference back to the original form of modernity, which is European. To me, it seems a bit odd to suggest that that constant referral back doesn't constitute a form of Eurocentrism. That in their eyes, simply multiplying our understandings of modernity is sufficient to not have this be understood as Eurocentric. But I would suggest that to the extent that multiple modernities continue to be understood as derived from the creative appropriation by those that followed of the institutional frameworks of modernity seen to originate in Europe, then the problem of Eurocentrism remains integral to the paradigm. And somewhat ironically, when Eisenstadt talks about the first instances of multiple modernities, he talks about them as occurring in America. So America is the place where you have the first expansion of modernity. And then he talks about communist Europe, and the, well, the communist Soviet type and the fascist national socialist type. So it's sort of ironic that even the first instances of multiple modernities, which are supposed to be not Eurocentric, themselves have their origins within Europe. So that's modernization theory and then multiple modernity. So what then of the post-colonial critique of modernity and how might it understand or how might it alter our understanding? Here what I want to do is present to you the sort of two main traditions that, that I've worked with in terms of thinking through a more generalized critique and that's both post-colonial theory and coloniality modernity which is associated with the decolonial school of people like Annabel Quijano, Maria Lagones, and, and Walter Mignola. I guess firstly in terms of thinking about it in terms of post-colonial theory, I mean in part what both, what both traditions enable is the opening up of questions of what constitutes the making of the modern world. So with the decolonial school there's a very strong sense that the modern world that comes into being cannot be disassociated from the colonial forms that constitute the first engagement between the Europeans and the Americas. I mean, their focus is specifically on Latin America, the relationship between Europe with Latin America in the 14, from 1492 onwards. And that this broader history has to be part of the way in which we understand modernity. And so what they argue is that if modernity is understood only in terms of the histories of Europe, and it erases that broader history that points to the connection between Europe and Latin America, then modernity is being presented in particular terms that erases a broader context, and that broader context is coloniality. And without that, what modernity on its own does is reproduce a colonial paradigm. And so they argue for modernity coloniality that every time we talk about modernity, we should also think about coloniality. In terms of post-colonial theory, I mean, one of the things that I found most useful from the work of Homi Baba was his argument that what we need to do is to disrupt the standard discourses of modernity by shifting the frame through which we, un through which we view the events of modernity and questioning what we consider those events to be. So this isn't a version of multiple modernities in that we think about a different modernity or different histories but rather we think about what's missing from the histories that we're told are the histories of modernity. And so instead what he does is call on us to interrogate the conceptual paradigm of modernity as it's been commonly understood from the perspectives of those others who are usually relegated to its margins. And the task, as he suggests, is to take responsibility for the unspoken, unrepresented past within our present and through an understanding of them reconfigure what it means to be modern. And this reconfiguration isn't 
about delegating difference as simply cultural difference, but it's how can that difference make a difference to our understanding of modernity? So what I want to do at this point is perhaps talk through an example of how taking into account these other histories could make a difference to the standard narratives with which we operate. So one of the standard narratives, as I was saying earlier, was this idea of how the emergence of democracy is related very strongly to the French Revolution. Sometimes also people talk about the American Declaration of Independence. These two events together constitute the emergence of the modern world and of democracy within that modern world. The revolution in Haiti occurs at the same sort of time as both the French and the American Declaration, but it's never there as part of our understandings of the revolutions that bring the modern world into being. And yet, I would suggest that not only is it as fundamental as those two, but it's more radical than either of them. Now, this isn't to suggest, I guess I should just bracket here, that this isn't to suggest that people haven't written histories of Haiti. Obviously, there have been histories written of Haiti in the work of people like C.L.R. James, uh, the Black Jacobins is, is one of the most notable accounts that we have of this. But there's been a lot of work over recent years, Michelle Roth Trujillo, um, David Geger, Sybil Fisher and others have done a lot of work on thinking about Haiti and thinking about what it means for the social sciences in particular sorts of ways. But if you look at any social science module outline, which is on democracy, it's very rare that you'd find Haiti as the example with which to think through the emergence of democracy or understandings of sovereignty or citizenship. And so, what was the Haitian Revolution? So for those of you who might not know about it, Haiti previously had been called Saint-Domingue. It was a colony that had been taken over. It's an island in the Caribbean, sort of close to Cuba. It was colonized by the Spanish and then by the French, and it was one of the most uh, what's the word? It produced the most amount of wealth for the French Empire at that time. It produced something like one third of the world's coffee and half of the world's sugar came from this island of Saint-Domingue. The conditions there were incredibly brutal. The plantations were worked by enslaved Africans who were brought over mostly from West Africa to work within the plantations. But because the regime was so brutal, up to a third to 50% of people died within a year of being brought over. Instead of making the conditions better and enabling people to live and reproduce and to reproduce slavery through those sorts of processes, it was deemed to be more cost effective to continue to bring more people from Africa over to the islands. One of the consequences of this was that Sandman had a higher proportion of people who had been born free and not born into slavery, and so were on the island with a sense that this isn't how it had to be, but that this was something that could and should be contested. There are a whole series of uh, revolutionary sort of uprisings during the 1780s and 1790s, in part also prompted by the fact that the French Revolution happens in 1789. It talks about freedom, liberty, equality for all, and people are sort of saying, well, equality and freedom for us as well then. And yet when they make that demand, it's contested by the white French. And so instead, there ends up being a revolution. So there's a revolutionary period during the 1790s. And eventually in 1804, the, uh, the people who'd been enslaved self-emancipated themselves and declared the, the island to be free and slavery to be abolished. One of the first things that they did on declaring their own independence was to rename the island Haiti. So it had been Saint-Domingue, they renamed it Haiti. They renamed it Haiti to honor the Taino Arawak people who had occupied that land before them and who'd been wiped out by French and Spanish colonization. So there's something there about the way in which people who've been through this sort of process nonetheless have that consciousness and engagement with where they are to honor those who've been there prior to them. The second thing that they do is to, uh, abol well, they, they abolish slavery completely, and this is the first time within the Western world that slavery is abolished. 
and they also develop an understanding of citizenship which is much more uh, open and inclusive than any form of citizenship that's in place at the time. Because remember again that with both France and the US, France keeps its other colonies, it, it abolishes slavery for a brief period but then reinstates slavery. The US remains a slave state until 1861 and then maintains another century of segregation. So neither in France nor in the US is everybody free and equal to whatever even in formal terms until the late 20th century. Haiti creates, establishes equal citizenship in 1804. And one of the ways in which, and we can talk, you know, I'm happy to talk about that in more detail, but the point here is not simply that we don't know about Haiti and we should know about Haiti. I think it's important that we do know about it. I think it's important that we know about it in its own terms. But I think then it's also significant to think about the difference that Haiti makes to our understandings of concepts that are associated with the emergence of the modern. So as I was saying before, modernity is one of the central concepts of the social sciences and citizenship then becomes one of the concepts associated with modernity and associated with the emergence of nation states. And this is the next bit that I want to get to. So how does knowing about Haiti change the way in which we might think about citizenship, both historically and in the present? And what I want to do is to sort of discuss these issues in relation to a book that was published about, when was it, three or four years ago now, I think, Pierre Rosson Ballon. He's a French political philosopher. He wrote a book called The Society of Equals. And he starts off in his introduction by talking about the three fundamental sites in world history when equality was established. It's the French Revolution, the US Revolution, and the Haitian Revolution. And when I first read this, I was like, oh wow, this is really interesting. So how does Haiti figure in the rest of his understandings of equality and citizenship. That mention of Haiti was on page 16. The book is 384 pages. It's never returned to again, <laughs> except in the index. And so there's this sense for well, what does sort of pointing to Haiti mean in a context when you then don't go on to think about the difference that it would make, or what does it, you know, what, what's the issue here? And in part, the issue is, is that Haiti had been a colony of France. So to talk about the spirit of equality as emerging in France, and then to have to think about France maintaining not only Saint-Domingue as its colony, but after Haiti emerges and establishes its independence, it continues to have colonial relationships in other parts of the world, then how does that contradict what the understanding of equality might be as the French develop it without taking the colonial into account. So that's in abstract terms, but let me give you a little bit of the history of what went on in the French Revolution. Now, what Rosson Ballon argues is that what we need to conceptualize equality is to think about the many ways in which we as individuals are different from each other. So he says that often when people have thought about equality, they've thought about it in terms of how are we all the same. But actually we need to think about the democratic equality of individuals. And by focusing on individuals, what he then also does is make group identity something that's problematic, particularly in its contemporary form. So he sees contemporary forms of group identity as forms of separatism, which are threats to the society of equals that he wishes to put forward. But the thing is, he never talks about the ways in which groups come to understand themselves as such. And so he naturalizes both the process of group formation and of the understanding of membership within groups. So much as white males, for example, might believe themselves to be neither gendered nor in possession of an ethnicity, but simply embodiments of a universal, so throughout the book, Rosson Ballon uses the concept of the nation of the French nation and sees its population historically as constituted solely in terms of its white citizens. So when he talks about citizenship and when he talks about membership of the French nation, he talks about it only in terms of the population that was white. 
And group identity for him, although he never uses the term white, he just talks about French, but the implication is obviously only the white French. And group identity is something that emerges later. But let's have a look. If we look at the history, the Code Noir, this is something that gets established in the late 17th century in France. And it governs the lives of the enslaved within the French Caribbean. And it's also extended to cover the lives of anybody who's colors who comes to France itself. And as Terry Stovall argues, the Code Noir is one of the first major examples of the conflict between political and legal equality and racial discrimination, that is discrimination based on group identity within the French state. So when Rosson Vallon talks about group identity as something that only emerges in the present, he fails to acknowledge or think about the ways in which the very legal forms that establish the French Republic as universal are themselves based on positing a group identity on others that sees them as different and having to be regulated in a different way. Beyond the Code Noir, during the revolutionary period, there were many debates in Paris about whether black men could be citizens or whether color itself was a bar to civic and political equality. There were debates in 1791 that proposed only non-whites born of free parents, but not freed men, should be accorded political equality. That decree was passed in May 1791, but then overturned. And then as a consequence of the revolutionary uprisings that were happening in Saint-Domingue at the time, there was pressure put on the French legislature to concede full racial equality, and then emancipation of those who had been enslaved. This was done in 1792 and 1794. These were tremendous achievements. So at the heart of the French Republic, you have a commitment, albeit temporary, albeit time limited, or you know, having been overturned, but nonetheless, there was a commitment to racial equality and full emancipation. When Napoleon comes into power, these things are Overturned, slavery is re-established across the French Empire, apart obviously from Haiti, and citizenship is reconfirmed as the preserve of white men. The point is that these conversations happened in the 1790s. <coughs> when we talk about the history of citizenship and the relationship of citizenship to race, the standard discussions are always that race emerges in the post-war period. In Britain, it comes in with the Empire Windrush. In France, it comes in with the relationship between Algeria and France subsequent to Algerian independence. And what I'm pointing to you here is that race is central to the construction of the French Republic. It's central to the construction of the way in which the French articulate their understandings of the universal. And that the French understanding of equality and the French understanding of what it is to be universal is a racialized concept from the outset. Racism brought in by those people who were called migrants in the 60s. Race is there in the very DNA of the French state. And it's not just France. I can give you the same history of Britain and Germany, if you wish. So Ross and Ballon's idea that national identity is itself not a poison of equality in the way that other group identities are presented as being, normalizes and homogenizes national group identity. So the way in which he understands the nation, or the way in which he understands France, is he understands France as having been a nation and as having a national history. And yet, if you know the history of France, France has never been a nation. France has always been an empire. It may have had a national project in the context of being an imperial state, but its concepts, its understandings, have always been articulated in the context of empire and with race as a hierarchical uh, differentiator within it. So the emergence of the nation, or to present the emergence of the nation as an endogenous event and as unconnected to the broader processes of colonization, dispossession, and appropriation, makes those who look different appear to be other in the present but actually, they were part of the polity in the past. They may have been a dominated part of the polity in the past, but to not recognize that they were part of that past is to exclude them, is to do a double exclusion in the present. So throughout the book, Ross and Malcolm equates equality with the sameness or homogeneity of membership within a community, but doesn't recognize that that community was heterogeneous, 
in its long durée. And this is the way in which he's able to discuss equality without any reference to the historical instances of enslavement and colonization. And this is why he could only mention Haiti on page 16 and never return to it, because it would undermine everything else that he had to say about France itself. So in this way, I hope that partly what I've been able to sort of present to you is the way in which it's not only enough to know about these other histories. So yes, we need to know that the histories that we're presented with as the histories of the emergence of the modern world are not simply the histories that are significant to the making of the modern world. There are both broader contexts to the histories that we're told about, and there are other histories. But the question then is, what difference does addressing these other histories make to the ways in which we think about the modern. Trudeau has this lovely phrase that it's not enough to add native stir and continue as normal. Adding the native has to make a difference to what we have thought before and how we go on to construct our categories in the present and for the future. So the issue isn't just simply to redefine in the present, but to redefine forwards, we have to actually reconstruct our past. And by reconstructing our past, we open up different sorts of possibilities for what we might do in the future. And I would suggest to you that at no time other than now has this been more urgent. Thank you.